So good afternoon, everyone. Um, I think it, it's probably sacrilegious to stop the queen in the middle of her song, but um, we're going to try and stay on schedule a little bit today um, and, and get us to our featured presenters to share with us um, some of their knowledge today. Um, if you are interested in the Spotify playlist, it is from the Equity Center out in Oakland. Um, and I'll ask one of my colleagues if they can scroll up and um, put the link down because it is a it's a great playlist. So thanks everyone for joining us today. And uh, let's see who's in the room. So in the chat box, um, can you share where you're coming from, your name, location, organization, anything you really want to share? And if anyone wants to um, unmute and share that, um, share their voices, we'd love to hear those as well. Um, or just share for us in the chat box. And it looks like um, we've got Jim and Julie from um, our affiliates in Washington and Vermont, um, and Sarah from Montana. Good to see all of you. Elizabeth Foster from Learning Forward. Anyone want to unmute and say hello? Okay. We don't have to. There will be plenty of time for us later on today to, to, um, to talk to each other. So um, I want to, as we start every NEA meeting um, with the land acknowledging, acknowledgement, so we began this meeting by acknowledging that we across the country meet on the traditional land served by America's first peoples. We honor America's first peoples and all elders past, present and emerging. And we are called on to learn and share what we learn about the tribal history, culture and contributions that have been suppressed in the telling of the story of America. And we want to also acknowledge that a land acknowledgement is the beginning of our journey, not the end. And so really encourage you to look for opportunities to contact our elected representatives to enact policies that seek to repair the harm done to those whose lands were taken and to those peoples who were forcibly relocated. So I'm Andrea Prejean, the Director of Teacher Quality here at the NEA. And I am called on today to set the table for today and for a year long policy forum um, that we um, are, are starting today. Um, so nearly 10 years ago, NEA's members and leaders started on this journey to define what teachers need to grow and develop and what students need to thrive. Um, it took many formats um, the priority schools agenda and the priority schools work which was to support struggling schools and students and families who were struggling, which you'll now see has um, uh, morphed into or um, our community schools work, which the teacher quality department leads for NEA. Um, what we have found out is that um, there is a great quote that I love from South America, South America, nothing about us without us is for us. And we found that to be very true about teachers that little about what they did in their daily professional lives did they have impact on or any voice about. So NEA uh, started the Commission on Effective Teachers and Teaching. And there were structures, these were structures, looking at structures and mandates that governed the practice of teachers and failed to acknowledge teacher voice, autonomy, and authority. That commission uh, led to a couple, uh, led to us to where we are today. It had an advisory camp committee of people such as Young Zhao, Gloria Ledson Billings, and Rick Hess, among others. It had panelists and discussants, such as Josh Beaver from the Teach for America, Barnett Berry, who was at that time at CTQ, I think has moved to uh, South Carolina, um, and our colleagues from CCSSO and Ed Trust. They were also this commission. Um, given advice by early educators, aspiring educators, what some of you call student teachers, but at NEA they are aspiring educators. What we know is student teachers who are our next generation and leaders today are often not asked about education. And so we consider that to be a very important part of this commission.
the commission led to a report um, that was the accountability task force report. That accountability task force report helped us define for ourselves, and we hope in part for the field, what it means to be a profession ready teacher. It led us to assemble an expert panel um, that um, our good friend Maria was a part of and other colleagues from around the education field, from parents um, and from universities, from our own affiliates. And they wanted to look and we asked them to look at two things. One, what does it take to support the growth, development, and excellence of teachers throughout their entire career? And what does it take to transform schools and create the environment that supports student learning and educator professional growth? That experts panel studied the continuum supports came up with recommendations for each career phase and recommendations for our NEA constituencies and partners. In a minute, I'm gonna show you um, an example of what those recommendations look like. What I think is very unique about this report and that we keep going back to, and which guides our work in the teacher quality department, is that it had recommendations for specific groups. So what should policymakers be doing about this? What should um, teachers be doing about this? What should unions be doing about this? And so it was specific in that way, uh, very intentionally. If you'd like a copy of it, you're welcome to either do a uh, Google search for the Great Teaching and Learning Report and put NEA in there and it'll pop up, or you can also use the QR code on this and it will give you um, a copy of the report. The, this is the uh, copy of who was on the expert panel. Um, we pulled from both our constituencies, um, people who work for um, the union or our union members and leaders. And then we also asked for um, support from our um, partners out in the field, as well as looking for um, as well as looking for people from um, universities um, to come in and help us think this through. I think that this is one of the early panels for NEA that pulled in more than our members and leaders. And we think those are vitally important. There are so many commissions that I go to, committee groups that I go to that are talking about teachers or talking about educators. And there is nearly a practicing pr practitioner in that room. And so it's really important at NEA that our panels and task force and committees that do work include people who are in the classroom and doing this work every day. But we also want to make sure that we are hearing from our partners. And that's why we really wanted to start um, this work again to start thinking about the work that we're doing in light of what we have seen happen um, over the past 18 months. Clearly when this expert panel was working, they did not have a pandemic to think about. And thinking about social emotional learning has become a huge piece of what we think is important for teachers. We know that teacher well-being leads to student well-being and student well-being leads to students thriving. Um, and so we want to start having a conversation about supporting teachers and communities and families that includes the filter of what has just happened to us in the last 18 months and what is continuing to happen to us um, going forward. So you will find in the report that we look at um, across the teacher continuing. So potential teachers, what are the supports needed for young people in K through 12 or professionals who are considering a career change? What should policymakers be putting in place? What should educators should be what should educators be thinking about in terms of um, supporting those young people in high school who think they want to be a teacher? Aspiring teachers. So teachers who are candidates currently in teacher preparation programs, what kinds of supports do they need? We hear from them a lot of pushback on on the praxis and on EdTPA and on other um, 
tests and assessments that they need to take. And so helping them understand why those kinds of supports might be necessary and also encouraging their voice in what would be better to make sure they are profession ready. Emerging educators who for us are new educators, they've just completed their teacher preparation program, they hold an initial license, they certainly need new and different things than teachers who are accomplished, who have been in 12, 15 years and are feeling accomplished and know how to manage their classrooms and what kinds of supports do they need. The linchpin or the thread that follows or that connects all of these is the idea of teacher leadership in my head's in the way. Teacher leaders are for us from the time you start thinking about becoming a teacher. Often we see in lots of programs and districts that you don't get to be a teacher leader until you're an accomplished teacher, until you're 15 or 16 years. For us and in, and in this report, being a teacher leader starts from the beginning. So our aspiring educators that are part of the aspiring educator program at NEA are already leaders in this area and are helping us think about policies and practices that support teachers and students. Um, our work at the teacher quality department uses teacher leadership as the viewpoint and the filter for when we decide on programs and policies. What kinds of um, supports do we need to give all teachers along the continuum so that they feel comfortable at the table and can raise their voice um, in decision making at decision making times. Um, so this is just an example of what you will find in the report. It will go through each of the um, teacher continuum pieces and tell you or ask you, support you, make recommendations about what um, you should be doing depending on your role in the education community. So if these are for potential um, teachers. If you look at teacher prep programs, you know, we're encouraging them to really host recruitment events. We would want teacher prep programs and I would actually even um, expand that to say universities in general should be reaching out to K-12, thinking about what kind of events they can put together so we can target a diverse population um, to move into the teaching. So you'll find these recommendations for each of the six um, pieces across the continuum with a specific recommendation depending on where you are in the education community. The report talks about these five keys of transformation. And um, we talk about a passion for learning and we wanna prioritize work that's been um, handed in, whether or not it's handed in on time, give people the flexibility um, and make a, a culture for more deeper learning for students. Thinking about assessment for excellence as opposed to assessing what's at the end. Why are we designing assessments in the first place? They have more than one um, goal than to assess students at the end, but they should be used as assessment for changing your teaching practice, for a whole host of things. Um, and are we going beyond easy to score tests and really thinking about what authentic assessment of student work is? Um, a culture of collaboration. Do we have teacher prep programs that generally, genuinely respect um, and include cooperating teachers as faculty of their programs? Are they thinking about how programs in pre-K through 12 should be connected to teacher preparation programs? Do we know that um, within, um, for instance, policymakers, a lot of people in this room today are policymakers. Is there collaboration between those of you who have primary responsibility at state, in state districts, um, and those of us at the national level? Authentic autonomy. Do we really trust teachers to chart their own professional growth path? And do we have priorities and um, supports for them that actually give them um, the ability to voice their needs um, when they're thinking about professional learning. And then I think the last one, number five, do we really respect 
worth of persons and communities do we really respect do we honor do we value experience culture language of each student do we see those languages as assets that we should be tapping into do we treat parents families community members as full partners and as decision makers not inviting them into the table but them being at setting the table as well do we understand that each of us is limited in some way in understanding culture and experience and does this cause us to um, open our own reservoir of empathy and caring for others and do we do this with grace we need to have all five of these keys in order to transform our profession schools districts initiatives and make sure that our schools and districts are designed in a way that all all students thrive and all families and communities feel valued. I'm going to actually skip this and um, move on to our presenters today because I know that what they have to share with us um, is really important. So Anne, I'm going to turn over to you. Good afternoon, everyone. It's really good to see all of you and to see some new faces and some old friends. It is my privilege to be able to introduce our presenters for today. And our first presenter is Maria Heiler. I have personally known Maria for over 15 years. Um, we were at the University of Maryland. She was that cool associate professor, assistant professor that was willing to sit with us and write and, and do all kinds of things. So her passion for teacher preparation has long been a part of her career, her work, and it just really bled into the work at LPI. So you can read what her current um, responsibilities at LPI are, but she'll always be that professor next door to me um, that has been a great friend to me personally, but to the NEA in general. And our other presenter is uh, Tara Keeney. Tara, we've also known since before LPI. Um, Tara uh, actually was on the Coalition for um, Teaching Quality, uh, Teacher Quality. Teacher, I always get Barnett Berries and the Coalition mixed up a little bit, but Tara was very involved in that work. She was part of a groundbreaking um, case several years ago around highly qualified teachers, Renee V. Duncan, if you're familiar with it, and uh, she was part of that legal team. So when she joined LPI, it really just, <laughs> it became another a facet of her work. So we are very excited that they are both here today to share with us and um, really excited to learn together. So ladies. Thank you for that enthusiastic um, introduction. And it's always good to be amongst friends, personal and our friends at NEA in general. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Uh, Tara and I are just excited to be able to be at this launch of this policy roundtable series that you are um, putting out over the next year. And while, um, Tara will be focusing in on the policies part of the uh, work. I'm going to start us off by laying some of the foundation of the research uh, that LPI has been doing and aligns with the work that Andrea, you were just talking about. So um, you'll get a sense of the research landscape as well as uh, the policy landscape as well. And I would just basically told you what we're going to do <laughs> and we'll have some time for Q&A and then you'll be having some small group discussions come back together and adjourn as well. So when we hear great teaching and learning, um, what is it that um, the question that we're addressing in particular is what kind of educators are needed and how do we develop and support these educators to transform teaching and learning? And I want to start with sharing some of the research on the science of learning and development and how that research has shaped how we know what students need to learn, thrive, and grow both academically and social emotionally. And subsequently, what our educators need to know and be able to do so to support that type of learning. So what do we know from the science of learning and development? We know that the relationships are essential, an essential ingredient that catalyzes healthy development and learning. 
We know that children actively construct knowledge by connecting what they know to what they are learning within their own cultural context. So their everyday lives, their um, cultures, their um, relationships and experiences. And related to these, those two principles is the knowledge that learning is social, emotional, and academic. So we can't be developing teachers that just say, I want to teach math, not kids, right? All of those are, all those are um, dependent on, on one another. And we know that students' perceptions of their own ability influence, and influence learning. And we know that adversity affects learning and that effective schools must be trauma-informed and healing-focused and that our educators must know those practices as well. So taking these principles into consideration, we can see clearly what students need to learn, grow, and thrive. First, students need positive learning environments that include supports for positive, trusting relationships, physical and emotional safety, and a sense of belonging and purpose for each and every student, no matter what their race, gender, country of origin, religion, or any of their social identities are that they bring to these spaces. Positive learning environments also include classroom communities with culturally competent teaching practices that help teachers know their students well and address stereotype threat. And that goes back to the principles of relationships, as well as the connection between social, emotional, and academic learning, as well as students' um, perceptions of their own ability. In addition to positive learning environments, students need rich learning experiences that build on their prior knowledge, offer relevant, engaging tasks, enable inquiry, acknowledges neurodiversity, and offer UDL supports, eliminates stereotype threat, replaces competition and comparison with collaboration, supports growth through feedback, reflection and revision, and teaches metacognition, cognitive strategies, and learning to learn. The science of learning and development also helps us understand that the conditions that students need for their social, emotional, and academic development. Students need regular and consistent opportunities to learn and integrate SEL and cognitive skills throughout the day, educative and restorative behavior supports that foster belonging rather than exclusion, and guidance to develop skills, habits, and mindsets that promote perseverance, resilience, and agency, such as executive functioning, stress management, and growth mindset. All of the things that we need as adults as well. These elements, positive learning environments, rich learning experiences, conditions for social, emotional, and academic development necessitate well-prepared and effective teachers who are able to create these types of sold-based learning environments and opportunities. So what does this look like? Educator development should emphasize both learner pedagogy as well as content pedagogy. This includes knowledge of and support for child and adolescent development and learning across all domains, development of practices that support integrated social, emotional, and cognitive development, the development of a curricular vision that supports progress across domains, the development of cultural knowledge and competence, including capacity to engage with families and communities in authentic and reciprocal ways, the development of a wide rep repertoire of skills and resources for scaffolding student learning and meeting student needs, and the development of practices for teaching metacognition and strategies for learning to learn. This development has implications for teacher preparation as well as professional development. So how can teachers learn these skills? Well, there's a book. <laughs> um, we did um, write a book uh, about seven teacher preparation programs across the nation, and the findings are in this book, Preparing Teachers for Deeper Learning. However, since you have me here, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version of it. So when we think of teacher education, we know that high quality teacher preparation programs include a coherent vision of teaching and learning enacted across all courses and clinical experiences, a strong knowledge base in development and learning applied to practice, modeling practices within university and clinical settings, an immersion in settings that support cultural and pedagogical learning, careful child study focused on context and learning, performance assessments in which candidates demonstrate practices, ongoing feedback, consultation and collaboration, and engagement and research about practice. 
When we see teacher preparation that looks like this, we see teachers who are prepared to engage in great, great teaching and learning. In addition to the elements of high quality teacher education, we need to think about the learning experiences of new aspiring and accomplished teachers as well. We need to create experiences that model equitable and empowering practices for educators. Teachers need relationships that support change, just like students do. For teachers that could be peers, coaches, uh, leaders in the building, families, community members. And these relationships need to be sustained through communities of practice. What does this look like? Very similar to what students need to learn, grow, and prosper. And so the bottom line is that everything students need for their learning, educators need as well. And this is particularly important because a lot of the times we have educators who go through PK-12 experiences not having the type of learning opportunities and learning environments that we want them to create for their students. And so it's very difficult to create spaces that you haven't experienced yourselves, which is why it's so important for teacher preparation and professional development to model these types of learning environments and learning opportunities. So we can also think about these elements in relation to what our in-service and accomplished teachers need in their own professional developments. And uh, we have a report on effective teacher professional development. And very excited to note that at the time the report was written, we saw much more of the type of professional development um, that was sit and get, drive by one, one type, one time workshops, one size fits all, disconnected from teachers' classrooms and, st and students. And nowadays we're seeing what. Um, we want professional development to look like, not all the time and not everywhere, but we're seeing more professional development that is content focused. So that can be content in terms of a specific pedagogical practice like small group work or inquiry or content focused such as a subject matter. So English, mathematics, social studies, active professional development. So not just getting lectured at, um, but engaged in the same work that we want our students to be engaged in labs or reading or writing on um, the importance of collabor collaboration. Um, it's not an isolated one off type of a um, professional development, but really working together with peers and coaches and students and families to um, create a collaborative learning experience for our educators. The use of models and modeling so that can be from teachers going into each other's classrooms and seeing what um, good teaching looks like or a particular unit or lesson being taught looks like, or it could be video cases or even written cases of exemplary teaching. Coaching and coaching can be one on one from peers to um, experts that come in or other um, community members that have uh, knowledge around students and their lives and experiences. Um, it can be outside uh, organizations or within the a home district. And then we find that uh, effective professional development includes feedback and reflection and the time to have an iterate, iterative cycle of trying things out, rece receiving feedback and reflecting on the practice as well. And then we know that there's no magic, magic number of PD, um, that PD needs to be sustained over time, that um, there's different models of just having regular intervals of PD or having an intensive maybe week long summer session and then having a periodic meetings um, throughout the years to revisit what was learned over the summer that can look like that can have different models but um, this idea of not just again a one off but sustained over time so uh, that um, that sh i just wanted to share quickly some of the research that we've done on um, the practices that uh, develop the types of educators we need for great teaching and learning. And now I'm going to pass it over to Tara, who's going to share what does this mean for policy? Thank you, Maria, so much for setting that research foundation for us and Andrea for setting the table for this conversation and really reminding us of um, the importance of the great teaching and learning report and um, how um, 
it continues to be relevant today, even as we're in the shifting landscape of the pandemic. Um, I want to spend a few minutes focusing on implications for policy, and I'm going to focus particularly on state policy, uh, given that so many of you uh, are working with your state affiliates and as well as our state policy partners on this call. Um, and I really want to look at what are the policies that are grounded in this evidence base that Maria shared um, and that can support great teaching and learning. Um, so next slide, Maria. So first, I think I let's talk about policies that can ensure that every teacher receives the kind of preparation that Maria was describing. And I, I see the kind of active chat thread um, that's happening uh, right now. I think it, it resonates here in this audience. At the Learning Policy Institute, we really think about this as having two essential aspects of a system of high quality preparation. We think about it as two hands clapping. On the one hand, uh, state policies can function to guide high quality practice, while on the other hand, strong preparation systems will also support broad access to that high quality preparation, right? So on the state system side, that means having strong standards that reflect what we know about how people learn, performance assessments that assess what educators can actually do in practice, accreditation and program approval systems that look at what programs are providing and what candidates are learning, uh, and data systems that reflect the recruitment distribution and retention of qualified educators and of, of course induction systems that support um, uh, candidates into the field as novice educators. But having those strong standards and that strong system is only one part of the equation and I'm thinking about Jim's comment here in the chat. If there are backdoors into teaching that enable districts to hire teachers who haven't had the benefit of that high quality preparation and haven't met the standards that the state has set. And with the, the shortages we're seeing all over the country right now, that is a challenge that many, many states are facing. So we need the other hand clapping too, the policies that will ensure broad access to high quality preparation. And that means in large part supports to make teacher preparation affordable. We can't ask candidates to take on huge debt to enter a profession where they're going to start uh, with average pay that's on average 20% less than other college ed educated professionals, uh, and that grows to 30% by mid career. Uh, and this is especially important, I'd say, for candidates of color who are on average taking on greater debt burdens um, and feel the impact of their debt more heavily. So policies like service scholarships and loan forgiveness programs are essential to broadening access to the profession. You know, that notion, a promise really, that if you commit to teaching in a high need school for a certain number of years, we will pay for your education, right? And alongside this, policies that support high retention pathways into teaching. I know NEA has been a strong champion of teacher residency programs, as well as grow your own programs that provide that intensive high quality clinical training. And we need policies that support strong partnerships between schools and districts and their educate, educator pro, uh, prep program partners, uh, as well as strong mentoring and induction for novice teachers. Next slide. So um, on that kind of first hand clapping, right, we're seeing states really take this up with a multi pronged approach. I'm going to use California, my home state, as an example. Um, so over the past decade or so, California has worked to really update its standards and strengthen and align those standards to guide high quality practice. Right? And they've incorporated whole child policies that are really grounded in the research that Maria just shared. Um, they started doing this back <coughs> around 2012. Um, actually, when the state was in the midst of, you know, feeling the effects of the Great Recession, right? And this was a place to dig in at that time when there wasn't a lot of funds for, for other um, work around the system. So um, they updated their standards to really focus on standards that support a positive school climate, on implementing restorative practices. They updated clinical practice requirements to make it clear that candidates um, needed 600 hours um, of really high quality clinical training. At the same time, the state was one of the first to pass a teacher performance assessment as a requirement for licensure. Um, they did this back in 2008 and haven't had, you know, Andrea referred to some of the pushback on that. 
But I'd say California avoided that because they let programs choose their performance assessment from a small group of state approved assessments. They really worked with programs on the performance assessment development process, provided a lot of TA and support to programs and to candidates as that was being implemented with state calibration processes. Um, and so it has, it has had fairly smooth implementation. And finally, the state has moved to a more performance-based um, form of program approval. They're now doing, for example, surveys of all program completers, as well as employers and master teachers. And the candidate survey, the response rate is something like 95% because they have candidates complete the survey when they go to apply online for their credential, right? So it's a very motivating factor to say, here's how I felt about how well prepared I was, and here are the places where I feel more or less prepared, and that feedback loop comes back to the programs. Um, so I've included links, Blake, Marie and I will send the PowerPoint to Blake to add to the Google Drive, and I have links to um, what these policies look like in California. Next slide. With the other hand clapping, we see many states taking steps to broaden access to high quality preparation, including through high retention pathways into teaching, like residencies and grow your own models. So Pennsylvania, for example, uh, is using their Title II ESSA funds to support teacher residencies as well as leader residencies. West Virginia is in the process of implementing a year-long uh, residency uh, requirement. And California just put $350 million in its most recent budget into teacher residencies at a per resident cost of $25,000 per resident. Other states are pursuing the grow your own strategy with an eye towards recruiting and preparing individuals from the community who are more likely to stay in the community and who um, can help to increase the diversity of the educator workforce there as well. So Tennessee used its uh, CARES Act dollars to invest in a grow your own um, teacher preparation program competitive grant program in many states i'll point to minnesota new mexico california and washington are investing in gyo programs that support para educators uh, to earn their teaching credential states are also working to cover all or or at least a, a big part of the cost of teacher preparation in exchange for that commitment to teach i would point to north carolina north carolina's teaching fellows program as a long-standing very well researched and very effective program um, uh, for service scholarships oregon as a teacher scholars program that's really focused on increasing educator diversity. And California, which again, just made big investments in the educator workforce, is providing $20,000 scholarships to individuals who commit to teach in a high need field and high need school for four years, enough to cover 5,000 candidates a year for the next five years in California. And finally, mentoring and induction programs for novice teachers are critical. And I'd say particularly now where we saw candidates have abbreviated training um, or interrupted training during the pandemic um, and the significant numbers of individuals we see entering the profession without having already completed preparation. So that support in their early years is even more important. Um, Illinois partnered with the state teachers unions uh, to use 6.5 million in CARES Act dollars to support mentoring for novice teachers with a particular focus on online teaching, social and emotional learning, right, and trauma-informed practice. And Iowa and New Mexico um, have strong, um, New Mexico made recent investments in its uh, mentoring program, and Iowa has a long-standing program. Next slide. LPI has written about a number of the state policies uh, to strengthen the, the profession in this report you hear on the slide taking the long view and I would point to the partnership for the future of learnings playbook that they released last May and I know NEA was a partner on this initiative um, that really that identifies a lot of newer state examples and provides sample legislation if you're looking for ideas for your state. Next slide. So I focused a lot on early career teachers um, but we also need policies that support and retain our more experienced and accomplished teachers. Given what the research shows us about what causes teachers to leave the profession, I want to point 
to a few potential policy strategies that are a really important part of supporting great teaching and learning. The first is competitive compensation, and that can include overall salary increases, but also increases uh, for taking on increased leadership roles or uh, demonstrated expertise, increases for teachers who commit to teach in high need fields or schools. We see loan forgiveness as a strategy to boost compensation for teachers early in their career. It effectively does so. Um, and then I, I just want to call out, you know, we're seeing huge staffing shortages across the country. And so compensation for subs that will actually attract and keep subs in the pool is a huge need right now um, and is really critical to supporting that culture of teaching and learning right if you're constantly having to cover your colleagues classes and dealing with that stress right it's hard to um to do your job um, and it uh, leads to much higher levels of burnout and i think we're seeing that all over the country right now um, second we need policies that provide teachers with robust opportunities to learn, grow, and collaborate. But Maria talked about the importance of providing strong, sustained professional learning opportunities. And COVID, with the shift to virtual and hybrid instruction, really, I think, helped many districts to see the possibilities around redesigning schools and, and um, using school schedules to create more collaboration time. Um, so I hope that this will be uh, a, some, something that can, comes out of the pandemic that really sticks here. Um, and I think we're seeing that play out in some places in master schedules. Um, supports for teacher leadership, including we're seeing many states support teachers in earning their national board certification, supporting that, that process, as well as um, supports with stipends for teachers who, who go ahead and earn the national board certification. And I wanna call out micro credentials, um, you know, really, enabling teachers to drive their own professional learning, demonstrate their accomplishment in ways that can be recognized. I know NEA has been a real leader in this effort, and I think the pandemic, again, has created an opportunity for, um, for districts, for states, and for individual teachers to see this as something that um, meets their professional learning needs in this particular moment. And finally, I think the research is clear that supportive and inclusive school leadership is really key to retaining teachers. Um, so policies that prepare and develop effective school leaders are an important part of the puzzle. And I think there are analogs to many of the policies we've been talking about today. Um, so both teacher leader residencies, for example, and um, service scholarships for aspiring principals. In this vein, I want to call out community schools as a policy approach that really does support that collaborative leadership and practice. That's one of the four kind of key components of community schools, along with uh, integrated student supports and active family and community engagement as well as enriched and expanded learning time. Um, I know NEA and its affiliates have been leaders on these policies in the states, and we see many states doubling down on the community schools approach because you know, they've recognized it as particularly effective in meeting needs uh, during the pandemic. So Vermont recently passed a community school policy with its uh, federal recovery funds, as has California, Maryland, New York, New Mexico, we're already pursuing this uh, approach prior um, to the pandemic. Um, and I'll just close by saying um, and emphasizing <laughs> that the job of being a teacher has grown exponentially during this pandemic, right? Teachers are being called on to support their own students through trauma, right? Through mental health crises, through this isolation. At the same time, they're struggling with with all of those things for themselves. They've had to dramatically adapt their teaching overnight. They're struggling with staffing shortages and sub shortages, high turnover, including of school leaders, all of which impacts those who are left behind right in their schools. And they're being called on to help students recover from 19 months of uh, disrupted learning. So we need policies right now to support teachers through these kinds of challenges. And while I've focused on state policy today, I just want to take a minute to mention federal investments. 
Certainly Recovery Act dollars can be used to prepare, support, and retain the educator workforce. We've highlighted that in this fact sheet, which is like an easy two-pager if it's helpful for you in, in your policy conversations. And of course, beyond the existing federal recovery funds, as we speak, there may be more coming depending on how this human infrastructure bill um, plays out. I know the administration has proposed $9 billion of investment in the educator pipeline, including for residencies, for grow your own programs, for service scholarships, for teacher candidates and supports for minority serving institutions. Um, so let, you know, fingers crossed that we'll have um, more supports from the federal government to be able to do this work at the state level. Um, Maria and I have included our contact information on the next slide and we'll drop it in the Google Drive. Um, don't, you know, be shy about reaching out to us if we can be helpful with your work in the states. And um, I will kick it back to uh, Andrea or Anne. I don't know who is facilitating the, the Q&A, but um, thanks so much for having us. We're really excited to be part of this conversation today and the forum going forward. Thanks so much, Tatara, um, for kicking it over to me. Um, okay. Andrea put it in the chat box and, and ladies, you provided us so much context. We really, really appreciate that um, to really you know, strengthen this conversation. Um, Andrea, put it in the chat box. If we wanna use this opportunity for everyone who's here, what questions do we have about what we've heard? Um, I've seen some comments in the chat box um, about the great things that are going on in, I think it's Vermont, Juliet, um, and what you all were able to do uh, to support alternative groups. Um, but also, what else is going on out there? You know, when we really think about what Tara and Maria presented to us, and Maria, thank you too. Um, what else is going on out there that we can use and we can help to support our questions you have? Um, folks along the career continuum. And feel free to grab a mic or you can drop it in the chat box too. P.S. I'm a former 13 year educator, so I know the wait time. <laughs> Go ahead, Rebecca. <laughs> Thank you. Um, these presentations were wonderful. I really enjoyed um, listening to them and um, much of what has been said really resonates um, with the work that we're doing and, um, you know, the, the work in strengthening teaching and learning and teacher preparation. Mm -hmm. One of my questions that I had was connected to, I think, the first presentation that um, Dr. Heiler gave. Um, and it was around um, some of the asks for university-based teacher preparation and um, it might be or it might have also been Andrea I can't remember it was right in the beginning um, and my my question is and I agree with what you're saying you know universities need to reach out and have um, teachers be part and connected to the teacher preparation programs one of the struggles that we see um, is that if universities value that schools and school districts don't have structures in place that value teachers roles in university teacher, pre teacher preparation. So my wondering is how do schools and districts value teacher voices in teacher preparation and their roles and presence? And that might not be something we answer, but I would love to see us look into that um, specifically because um, teachers aren't given extra time for mentoring teacher candidates. They aren't given extra compensation. Um, I was just reading a chapter on a book we have coming out um, about a situation in Connecticut where the teachers are actually paid more for mentoring novice teachers than they are working with teacher candidates. So there's a discrepancy there in policy and then how things get laid out in practice that um, even if they are valued and they want to be valued in teacher preparation, the structures that are currently in place on school district side um, and, and, and the policies around that, the, even the access to funding that schools can use to support that aren't there. The good news is that there are some um, districts and preparation programs that serve as models for what this can look like when it's done well. Um, the Ed Prep Lab, our network of um, teacher preparation and PK-12 um, partner districts, uh, that's a partnership between LPI and Bank Street Graduate School of Education has quite a number of preparation programs that um, 
authentically partner with their PK-12 districts. And we actually have on November 18th an event where it's just district partners talking about um, high quality partnerships and what it takes to have um, strong partnerships with um, teacher preparation programs. So I do um, wanna invite you to come to that on the 18th. And uh, the, the one, um, university that I'm thinking of right now is uh, Montclair State University in New Jersey, where they actually have a whole center um, designed to support the partnership between districts and the preparation programs. And um, the teachers can become certified as affiliate faculty, and they co-teach um, the courses in teacher preparation. And it's just a very robust way of thinking about um, teacher preparation being everyone's responsibility, um, the districts as well as preparation programs. And um, that kind of partnership really strengthens teacher preparation because it allows the preparation programs not to go on what they think districts need, but actually listen to the experts who say, this is what our district needs. And um, they can then co-develop and co-think about um, teacher preparation together and um, really be in it as, um, equal partners in the endeavor. So um, there are models out there and I'm happy to talk more about that, but do encourage you to come to the November 18th event so that you can hear from the districts themselves who have had authentic partnerships. Thanks for that, Rebecca. Um, Julia, I see your hand. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say one thing I'd also add is that the art funds can be used to set up those kinds of structures in school districts. And so, which is, I think, is why it is really important for us as um, advocates to be out there engaging with with districts and schools and states as they um, make decisions about how that money is spent. Thanks, Andrea. And I think a second part to that question um, is in the chat box with Patricia, meaning um, connected to it, related. And it is, what about preparation of the mentor slash supporting uh, supervising teachers? Where there be funding for supporting the individuals who will step step up to mentor our novice teachers. Yeah, I mean, I think um, to Andrea's point about um, ARPA funding and, and the federal recovery dollars, there's a lot of flexibility in those funds. Um, and I would, I'll drop it in the chat here in a minute. Um, the U.S. Department of Education put out guidance last May on how those dollars can be spent, and um, I'll point you to a particular question there where they really laid out um, how they can be used to support the educator workforce, both on the preparation and recruitment side, but also for the existing um, educator workforce, including the strong partnerships between districts and educator preparation programs um, and uh, supporting the existing workforce, including in their roles as mentor teachers. So um, it's just good stuff and you could take it into a conversation with your district and point them to what ed themselves have said. Um, uh, but um, in terms of funding in particular for mentor teachers and training on that front, I'm seeing, you know, some of the residency legislation, for example, is calling that out specifically in the definition of teacher residency in the statute. So, you know, they're defining it as providing, um, you know, uh, that residency working alongside an accomplished mentor teacher, right, who has training and who is compensated for, for taking on that role. So it doesn't, you know, define the specific amount, but it makes it clear um, that, that it needs to be compensated. So I think it can happen through legislation as well. Um, can I share one model that we did in, um, in Vermont in one school, the school that I was teaching at until 2013, when I took this role at Vermont NEA is I was the on-site coordinator. So in Burlington, you know, right outside of Burlington, there are five different schools that have teacher ed programs. So for the middle school, in many schools, it's the principal that, you know, the is the contact for placing student teachers. She did not do any of it. It was it was my role and I got paid a stipend because we also looked at this as a resource for the students in those classes. So I did the, you know, I co-taught the seminar with the university professor. I did all the student teaching placements. They had to interview the teacher. I talked to both of them to make sure it was a good fit if there were issues. They knew where my classroom was. Um, 
And it really made them feel like they belong to the school and that it was, you know, seamless. Um, and uh, one of my colleagues took that role over. So it's still a model that has gone through, but it hasn't spread beyond the middle school in that one school. But they get a, a lot of student teachers every year. But it That's makes an sense. amazing example. Thanks so much for that, Julia. Tara spot on. That is an incredible example. And we definitely have to think about ways that we can, you know, expand that and really scale it up um, and have these conversations. That's why these sort of events are, are important um, to have to be able to have these conversations. And, and to that, as we uh, sort of think through a lot of this, I'm wondering, though, how much of these things are like an equity lens that we probably need to um, uh, explore a bit more with policy. And so I guess for the group is how can we use that to, you know, an equity lens to better shape um, our policies to support all of these things that we're talking about right now. Any ideas on ways that we can use equity as a part of the conversation to sort of shape some of the policy decisions that are being made um, across this career continuum? And we've talked about, you know, access, um, the way buildings are set up um, with time allotment, um, you know, not having the time to work with people in an intentional way. We talked about how we can use ARP funding um, in ways in which we can use it. So how do we bring in this equity part to the conversation to sort of really push um, all of the great things that you know Tara and Maria presented that we we need to focus greater on. Hi, this is Idalia Schumann with Kansas. And I think as we start looking at the obvious need for attracting um, more minority students into the field of teaching that really is an equity piece where of course i believe that we need to ensure that we have quality supports for their success through that teaching continuum from maybe even through your grow your own programs all the way through uh, their experience in their ed programs and then for their placements Thanks for that, Adalia. Definitely, definitely. Grow Your Own is definitely a place in which we can completely have these conversations. Um, I see in the chat box, Casey said more incentives at HBCU. Um, Casey, do you have an idea of what that might look like? Hi, um, do I have an idea of what that might look like? I definitely think that some of the incentives that were brought up in the slides would be great. Um, definitely loan forgiveness. Um, possibly some sort of stipend or even just pay for the program in general. Um, I think it's definitely come to that. Uh, we need more black teachers. We need more teachers of color. Um, we're not going to be able to support our students of color if we don't have teachers of color. And so it is incredibly important that we fund their education um, in order to make sure that we have a generation of students who come up um, from those teachers and you know we can continue to have those kids looking at their teachers saying I want to be a teacher I want to make a difference um, and I think that can you know do so much and uh, for education in general okay thanks so much Casey for that um, definitely you know access and, and the opportunity um, in ways in which you know um, things currently go you know having the ability to have someone else be um, sort of pay for it because as as was mentioned that isn't a big issue you know completing a program and finishing with large amounts of debt and so you have that over your head and trying to learn about this new profession that requires you you in ways in which you you really don't know until you get into it like you you have we all have this perception in school and then the reality sets in and so definitely definitely and we see a couple of things in a chat box um, and Dana mentioned the opportunity to have experiences in different settings, um, which is definitely important too. Um, 
uh, definitely a big part of the conversation. Um, I am going to um, say we're going to record all the information you have in the chat box. And if any of these questions come up for you all, or if you have ideas or examples of it, feel free to shoot um, the email and the information you have, because we definitely want to make sure we keep forward and in the front of our minds, the equity lens and what great uh, teaching and learning looks like. Um, and I'm going to kick this off to Anne, I think. Adrian. Adrian, sorry, Adrian. The other A, the other A, Adrian. Uh, thanks, thanks so much. And first of all, I'd like to say to Maria and Tara, thank you so much for the information that you shared today. You actually made this transformation of teaching and learning sound so easy. Not, not. But first of all, I do want to thank Maria and uh, Tara for uh, giving us food for thought, food for father, in terms of what is needed for great teaching and learning and what state policies are needed to guide the preparation and the high quality practice. So we listened to our experts to give us the, the information, the nuts and bolts. Uh, then we had an opportunity for some of the Q&A, but now we're going to get the uh, break into, go into breakout sessions, whereby we're going to have the folks to share situations and share and, and kind of assemble and just dissect and parse what you heard today. And so I'm going to ask if our PowerPoint is still available to move to the next PowerPoint slide. If I think that's my colleague and there, thank you very much. And in our next period, what we're going to do is going to ask you to consider your state and local context. And there's a slide, there's a question already done. And because we're really short on time and this needless to say, we can, we know that this is not an easy, an easy, um, question or a topic to get to and find solutions in a short period of time. But we want to start at least start the discussion in these small breakout sessions. And here's the question I want you to consider. What promising policies do you have in your role? Organizations to transform schools for equity and excellence in teaching and learning. And what next steps do you need to take and why? But as you consider that question, I want to make that question a little bit more relevant and it could be a little bit more con uh, complex. I want you to think of that question in terms of small p political context, the political context. I'm talking about um, political with a, a small p, that being what impact has the pandemic had on this particular promising policy opportunity? We know that the pandemic has highlighted a whole lot of issues, equity issues. I think Tara already mentioned about the shortage of personnel and so on, so that has come up. Add that to the mix as you think through the policy, uh, promising policy opportunities. So add to the mix the pandemic, equity issues, shortage of educators. And as you're in your group, you're going to be in your group for 10 minutes. We add in an extra three minutes. Wow, you get 13 minutes. And the extra three minutes, the 180 seconds is for a bio break. So do what you want in that 180 seconds. You come back and then you get 10 minutes in your small group to discuss this particular question. In each one of the small groups, there will be a, one of my colleagues from Teacher Quality there to help with the facilitation of the questions uh, and of the discussion. When you come back, the most challenging part for teachers is that you will have two minutes, 120 seconds. You will have two minutes to what was the most relevant or what, what particular policy actually rose to the top that would get traction here. So two minute reporter. So identify a reporter. It will not be the TQ person identify a reporter from your breakout session to come back and report. What was that promising uh, policy opportunity that when we look at it through the small p politics that would have traction given where we find ourselves today? So with that being said and done, I'm gonna ask Anne to break us into the small breakout sessions. And I'm going to ask my, uh, my uh, colleagues to put, I'll go and put the question inside the chat box so everyone will have a copy of the question. Okay, so in theory, this is going to work. It's already there. Is it there? Yeah, they oh, put wow. it in there. But it, a Thank bit you so very much. See, they're on top of it, but we'll see wow. if I'm on top of it with breakout rooms. I always sort of <laughs> hold my breath when I do it. So if there's an issue, please come back. So I'll see everyone in 13 minutes. One person there, uh, Juliet. And uh, she had a lot to share. So Julie, uh, will you mind sharing the uh, project that you were sharing with Tara and I just before we cut off? And you can connect with Tara afterwards. So sure. So, so one of my ideas is just, you know, we have a very 
you know, we our, our aspiring educator program is it's it's just a really hard one for us to get going in a, in a really meaningful way. Um, so one of our thoughts is to create a, you know, look at where our student interns are and have a sort of a, 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 a member as a as you know as, as their ambassador to Vermont NEA to support all of the interns as they're doing their internship um, and um, you know and then connect with people from different programs kind of at the state level through different workshops and, and trainings but having that connection with a teacher that's not their mentor teacher but um, somebody that can support them in their you know, facilitating that professional vision, offering support. Um, so that's something that we've been uh, kind of playing with those ideas in Vermont. Thank you very much, Julie. Now, can I throw it over to the next group? Another person that was the, the reporter from that group, please. Um, I'll go, I was in room number one um, with, um, sure, um, with um, Keisha and Jaquel. Um, we talked about how um, the test, the practice that comes before becoming a teacher is, is, in, is inequitable and that um, ways to, um, because of the biases in the exams and, and that it, it is a gatekeeping mechanism or seen as a gatekeeping mechanism um, and also that cost is a factor. So that, that, that's something um, that Jaquel is, is actively working on. Um, and also that um, teachers should be leaders or seen as leaders from the beginning of their careers, not just when they hit a certain number of years um, in practice. Um, and that was Keisha's idea. And I talked about how I work with after school professionals who don't always know what the pathway to um, to becoming a teacher and educator or working in a in a in a public school um, is, but they have the skills, and so working towards finding ways and getting the information to them about how to do that. Thank you very much, Dana. Thank you for reporting out. So, is room two available? Who from room yep. two? I, ha I think we were room two. Okay. Um, so I was in a group with Amy and um, Rebecca. And Amy discussed that in um, Virginia, there really, there's a focus right now on the lack of nationally board certified teachers in rural areas. So they have a high concentration um, in other areas, but not the rural areas. And that's where they're seeing a lot of need in schools to have high quality teachers. And so um, the pandemic has kind of opened this opportunity with a teacher shortage to um, build relationships with the districts in that area who were hesitant to work with VEA. They are now more willing to sit at the table and have discussions on how they can move that forward. Um, they are also working on in a spot like matching up um, nationally board certified teachers with aspiring educators to start them on that process of becoming really highly qualified educators um, and mentoring them through their early years as teachers. So I think that that's, you know, a wonderful partnership that's out there. Um, in Delaware, we um, statewide are working on an alternative to the praxis. So much like um, Jaquel talked about, um, praxis two, um, we are noticing last year we had 1300 teachers in Delaware who could not pass the Praxis II. Um, and so and it has a history of people not being able to um, pass it. But we have a teacher shortage right now. That's 1300 teachers that could have been in the classroom with qualifications that are amazing for educators. Their GP and we're gonna look at their GPAs maybe as an alternative that if they're, there's another portfolio that they can put together of their work that shows that even if they can't pass the praxis to they can still get that we can get them in the classroom and we can get them teaching and they can get that teaching license and then Rebecca 
we got cut off, but, um, and so she may have to fill, fill in for me, but she has these, they have nine essentials for professional um, development schools, and they have um, one compre comprehensive mission. And one of the ones that she was talking about was around anti-racism. And I think she put it into the chat and that can really, so that it's there for you guys. And it, I don't know, Rebecca, if you wanna jump in because we got cut off right at the end. Sure, I was just sharing since we've been talking about um, school university partnerships that the National Association for Professional Development Schools released a revised document back in January. So I placed that link in there. Um, and we really, as an organization, um, place an intentional focus on equity, social justice, and anti-racism. Um, as an organization, we're creating a structure, or we, we have created an anti-racism committee um, dedicated to this work. Um, so that we can look not only internally at the organization and the, the things that we are doing, but also externally in supporting um, school university partnerships across the country um, and advancing this comprehensive mission. Um, hey, Rebecca, it, may yes. I just interrupt for a moment? Sure. Can you put that link into the chat so that we can uh, access that information? Because I'm just very cognizant of time, but could you please put that in the chat because we want to follow up on that? Sure, I did. Well, I don't already. Get it, okay, get it come you. up. I'll put it up again for you. Okay, all. then thank you very much. And I, I apologize for cutting you off, but I'm just trying to get through the rest of them. But thank you. Uh, I think room number five. I don't recall if I said five before. Or did I? I think Julie was four. I think we were four. So room five. No, we were four. I can. Um, okay, then. Quick, okay, I'm missing. I'm missing two more rooms. Four can go. She just said that. Okay. All right. So um, I was with Julianne and Regina, and we were oh. talking about um, opportunities in terms of the community-based schools, building places um, and connections with stakeholders, businesses. Um, using the newly found technology that we've learned over the pandemic as a um, additional resource to to connect with other people, but also making sure that we are connecting teachers professionally and personally. Um, supporting so Regina talked about supporting equity on all fronts um, students with disabilities teachers, we also talked about teachers in rural areas and giving them equitable access to um, professional learning. Um, I think that's it Regina's also. Um, in the trenches right now in the classroom, so she was trying to jump on and and double tasking with teaching her class so. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, Thank right. You. Thank you very much. So our next room, I think, is room. Uh, and I, again, I apologize. Uh, though I did teach math, my my numbers are the sink here right now. So I'm not sure if room three went. Did anyone from room three offer? Yes. yes. Hi, Adrian. Uh, this is Luis Gustavo. And uh, room three, we had Colleen Hines and Marietta English. And um, we just got started on the conversation and, and I'll pass it over to Colleen if she would just like to uh, give us a recap. Um, the, we were just starting to talk about different ways that we could focus on um, helping expand understanding around policy and leadership training. And so the teacher leadership um, institute that NEA has, we were just starting to talk about how it's at the state level, but you can also develop leaders at the local level. And the teacher leadership pathways are association leadership, policy leadership, and instructional college um, um, leadership. And how those expanding those areas within a group of um, teachers can help advance the programs. Thank you very much, Colleen. Nice seeing you. Yes. <laughs> and our last group, our last room, I think is room six. That was our room and I'm not sure who is going to present. But I did think that Patricia, you should at least mention what you mentioned about the student teaching and the on that you saw over the pandemic. Oh yeah, we we had uh, Idalia 
and Tiffany and Sarah and myself in uh, group six, and we talked about the pandemic, the the things that you know became pretty evident about the inequities about teachers who had students who did not have access to the virtual learning platforms, schools that had to uh, move to set up school buses in parking lot in their school parking lots, so some families could bring their children so they could have access to virtual instruction. Uh, we had um, teachers who were burning out so fast that it was hard to even keep up with uh, all the changes that were happening in their lives with schools scrambling to provide the professional development they needed to, to pivot to using technology and the new platforms that the different schools were purchasing and they were inundated with professional development and also trying to integrate and transfer their instructional practice to remote uh, venues. The silver lining of that was we discovered that our interns who were much more tech comfortable uh, just stepped right up to the plate and became equal partners, co-teachers with their cooperating teachers. Uh, the supervisors, the adjunct supervisors, also found themselves working very closely as a team with the intern and the cooperating mentor teacher to solve every little problem that came along. And the feeling of it was they were feeling much more connected during the pandemic to their clinical experience because of uh, these contexts in which they had to work together almost on a daily basis. And they got to know each other so much better and developed really tight, strong relationships. So right. these were some things that happened that we observed and uh, we want to try to keep some of that because you know, we were able to have orientations virtually with cooperating teachers, which we hadn't done before, which was great. Thank you very much. And I wanna thank you all for the, your feedback, your report outs. The challenge with this always is that you, you get engaged in this, these small group discussions and 10 minutes is not very much time. I, I recognize that. And a lot of you, I wish I had the opportunity for us to share even longer. But again, I, uh, we're very conscious of our time constraints here. But again, thank you so very much for the rich sharing. So I'm going to turn this over to uh, Andrea to take us home. So again, thanks everyone. So I cognize that we are at four o'clock. I wanted to say, um, thank you to Tara and Maria for coming in and sharing their knowledge and their passion for teaching and learning with us. Um, it is always a pleasure um, to work with our colleagues at LPI. I really want to acknowledge that on um, this call with us today are a couple of our three maybe of our teaching fellows. Um, we have uh, 10 to 11 released teachers across the country that NEA is funding. Um, and they are working with their state affiliates um, to implement professional learning um, in their states. And we'll be taking all of that great knowledge back to their classrooms next year. But we are so enjoying working with them this year. And I know they are doing really great work. Um, just a point of personal privilege to thank the staff of TQ, the policy team, especially um, in the work that they're doing and setting this up. I um, want to let you know that our second round table is scheduled for January 25th um, from 2.30 to 4. And we are, our topic that day will be English language learners. So we will absolutely send out a notice as we get a little closer. But if you're somebody who is opening their brand new planner for the next year and you want to put something on it, you can, you can put that. So thanks everyone for your time. Um, as Blake said, he will make sure to get all the slides from our presenters into that folder so you can access that um, at your leisure. Thank you so much. Have a really great afternoon. Bye-bye.